All right, here we go. Part two of the Rygate Squires. Hope you guys are enjoying the memoirs of Sherlock Holmes. I sure am. I love doing all these different character voices. This one had a lot of different characters, which is a lot of fun to be able to just kind of come up with all the, the different personas and stuff that would fit these different uh, characters. Lots of fun. Hope you guys are enjoying it. If you are, I would love to hear from you. And right now, uh, the, during the time that I'm recording this audiobook, uh, you have a chance to not only tell me what you think, but also get an answer and Entered into a chance, entered for a chance. Wow, I can't talk today. Entered for a chance to win four free audiobooks, and there's going to be five listeners that win. So you have a really good shot at, at getting in there. So make sure that you go to anotherworldaudiobooks.wordpress.com, or you can click the show. Um, just look at the show notes of, on this podcast, and all the instructions are right there. And if you do that, and uh, yeah, you'll get entered to win, and you could you could win four free audiobooks. Can't be that. So now, without further ado, I give you the conclusion. Of the Rygate Squires. In the first place, said Holmes, I should like you to offer a reward, coming from yourself, for the officials may take a little time before they would agree upon the sum, and these things cannot be done too promptly. I have jotted down the form here, if you would not mind signing it. Fifty pounds was quite enough, I thought. I would willingly give five hundred, said the J.P., taking the slip of paper and the pencil which Holmes handed him. This is not quite correct, however, he added, glancing over the document. I wrote it rather hurriedly. You see, you begin, whereas, at about a quarter to one on Tuesday morning, an attempt was made, and so on, it was at a quarter to twelve, as a matter of fact. I was pained at the mistake, for I knew how keenly Holmes would feel any slip of the kind. It was his specialty to be accurate as to fact— but his recent illness had shaken him, and this one little incident was enough to show me that he was still far from being himself. He was obviously embarrassed for an instant, while the inspector raised his eyebrows, and Alec Cunningham burst into a laugh. The old gentleman corrected the mistake, however, and handed the paper back to Holmes. "'Get it printed as soon as possible,' he said. "'I think your idea is an excellent one.' Holmes put the slip of paper carefully away into his pocketbook. "'And now,' said he, "'it really would be a good thing that we should all go over the house together, and make certain that this rather erratic burglar did not, after all, carry anything away with him.' Before entering, Holmes made an examination of the door which had been forced. It was evident that a chisel or strong knife had been thrust in, and the lock forced backward with it, We could see the marks in the wood where it had been pushed in. "'You don't use bars, then?' he asked. "'We have never found it necessary.' "'You don't keep a dog?' "'Yes, but he is chained on the other side of the house.' "'When do the servants go to bed?' "'About ten. "'I understand that William was usually in bed also at that hour.' "'Yes.' It is singular that on this particular night he should have been up. Now, I should be very glad if you would have the kindness to show us over the house, Mr. Cunningham. A stone-flagged passage, with the kitchens branching away from it, led by a wooden staircase directly to the first floor of the house. It came out upon the landing opposite to a second, more ornamental stair, which came up from the front hall. Out of this landing opened the drawing-room and several bedrooms, including those of Mr. Cunningham and his sons. Holmes walked slowly, taking keen note of the architecture of the house. I could tell from his expression that he was on a hot scent, and yet I could not in the least imagine in what direction his inferences were leading him. "'My good sir,' said Mr. Cunningham with some impatience, "'this is surely very unnecessary. That is my room at the end of the stairs, and my son's is the one beyond it.' I leave it to your judgment whether it was possible for the thief to have come up here without disturbing us. You must try round and get on a fresh scent, I fancy, said the son with a rather malicious smile. Still, I must ask you to humour me a little further. I should like, for example, to see how far the windows of the bedrooms command the front. This, I understand, is your son's room? He pushed open the door. And that, I presume, is the dressing-room, in which he sat smoking when the alarm was given. Where does the window of that look out to? He stepped across the bedroom, pushed open the door, and glanced round the other chamber. 
I hope that you are satisfied now, said Mr. Cunningham tartly. Thank you. I think I have seen all that I wished. Then if it is really necessary, we can go into my room. If it is not too much trouble. The J.P. shrugged his shoulders and led the way into his own chamber, which was a plainly furnished and commonplace room. As we moved across it in the direction of the window, Holmes fell back until he and I were the last in the group. Near the foot of the bed stood a dish of oranges and a carafe of water. As we passed it, Holmes, to my unutterable astonishment, leaned over in front of me and deliberately knocked the whole thing over. The glass smashed into a thousand pieces, and the fruit rolled about into every corner of the room. "'You've done it now, Watson,' said he coolly. "'A pretty mess you've made of the carpet.' I stooped in some confusion and began to pick up the fruit, understanding for some reason my companion desired me to take the blame upon myself. The others did the same and set the table on its legs again. "'Hello!' cried the inspector. "'Where has he got to?' Holmes had disappeared. "'Wait here an instant,' said young Alec Cunningham. "'The fellow is off his head, in my opinion. Come with me, father, and see where he's got to.' They rushed out of the room, leaving the inspector, the colonel, and me staring at each other. "'Well, my word, I am inclined to agree with Master Alec,' said the official. "'It may be the effect of his illness, but it seems to me that—' His words were cut short by a sudden scream of, "'Help! Help! Murder!' With a thrill, I recognized the voice as that of my friend. I rushed madly from the room onto the landing— the cries, which had sunk down into a hoarse, inarticulate shouting, came from the room which we had first visited. I dashed in, and on into the dressing-room beyond. The two Cunninghams were bending over the prostrate figure of Sherlock Holmes, the younger clutching his throat with both hands, while the elder seemed to be twisting one of his wrists. In an instant, the three of us had torn them away from him, and Holmes staggered to his feet, very pale, and evidently greatly exhausted. "'Arrest these men, Inspector!' He gasped. What charge? That of murdering their coachman, William Kerwin. The inspector stared about him in bewilderment. Oh, come now, Mr. Holmes, said he at last. I'm sure you don't really mean to... Tut, my man, look at their faces, cried Holmes curtly. Never certainly have I seen a plainer confession of guilt upon human countenances, the elder man seemed numbed and dazed, with a heavy, sullen expression upon his strongly marked face. The son, on the other hand, had dropped all that jaunty, dashing style which had characterized him, and the ferocity of a dangerous wild beast gleamed in his dark eyes, and distorted his handsome features. The inspector said nothing, but, stepping to the door, he blew his whistle. Two of his constables came at the call. "'I have no alternative, Mr. Cunningham," said he. I trust that this may all prove to be an absurd mistake, but you can see that... Ah, would you? Drop it! He struck out with his hand, and a revolver which the younger man was in the act of cocking clattered down upon the floor. Keep that, said Holmes, quietly putting his foot upon it. You will find it useful at the trial, but this is what we really wanted. He held up a little crumpled piece of paper. The remainder of the sheet? cried the inspector. Precisely. Oh, where was it? Where I was sure it must be. I'll make the whole matter clear to you presently. I think, Colonel, that you and Watson might return now, and I will be with you again in an hour at the furthest. The inspector and I must have a word with the prisoners, but you will certainly see me back at luncheon time. Sherlock Holmes was as good as his word, for about one o'clock he rejoined us in the Colonel's smoking room, he was accompanied by a little elderly gentleman, who was introduced to me as Mr. Acton, whose house had been the scene of the original burglary. "'I wished Mr. Acton to be present while I demonstrated this small matter to you,' said Holmes, "'for it is natural that he should take a keen interest in the details. "'I am afraid, my dear Colonel, that you must regret the hour that you took in such a stormy petrol as I am.' "'On the contrary,' answered the Colonel warmly. I consider it the greatest privilege to have been permitted to study your methods of working. I confess that they quite surpass my expectations, and that I am utterly unable to account for your result. I have not seen the vestige of a clue. I am afraid that my explanation may disillusionize you, but it has always been my habit to hide none of my methods. 
either from my friend Watson or from anyone who might take an intelligent interest in them. But first, as I am rather shaken by the knocking about which I had in the dressing room, I think that I shall help myself to a dash of your brandy, Colonel. My strength has been rather tried of late. I trust that you had no more of those nervous attacks. Sherlock Holmes laughed heartily. We will come to that in its turn, said he. I will lay an account of the case before you in its due order, showing you the various points which guided me in my decision. Pray interrupt me if there is any inference which is not perfectly clear to you. It is of the highest importance in the art of detection to be able to recognize out of a number of facts which are incidental and which vital. Otherwise your energy and attention must be dissipated instead of being concentrated. Now, in this case, there was not the slightest doubt in my mind from the first that the key of the whole matter must be looked for in the scrap of paper in the dead man's hand. Before going into this, I would draw your attention to the fact that, if Alec Cunningham's narrative was correct, and if the assailant, after shooting William Kerwin, had instantly fled, then it obviously could not be he who tore the paper from the dead man's hand. But if it was not he... It must have been Alec Cunningham himself, for by the time that the old man had descended, several servants were upon the scene. The point is a simple one, but the inspector had overlooked it because he started with the suspicion that these county magnates had had nothing to do with the matter. Now, I make a point of never having prejudices, and of following docilely wherever fact may lead me, and so, in the very first stage of the investigation, I found myself looking a little askance at the part which had been played by Mr. Alec Cunningham. And now I made a very careful examination of the corner of paper which the inspector had submitted to us. It was at once very clear to me that it formed part of a very remarkable document. Here it is. Do you not now observe something very suggestive about it? It has a very irregular look, said the colonel. "'My dear sir,' cried Holmes, "'there cannot be the least doubt in the world "'that it has been written by two persons doing alternate words. "'When I draw your attention to the strong T's of at and to, "'and ask you to compare them with the weak ones of quarter and twelve, "'you will instantly recognize the fact. "'A very brief analysis of these four words "'would enable you to say with the utmost confidence "'that the learn and maybe are written in the stronger hand "'and the what in the weaker.' "'By Jove, it's as clear as day!' cried the colonel. "'Why on earth should two men write a letter in such a fashion?' Obviously the business was a bad one, and one of the men who distrusted the other was determined that, whatever was done, each should have an equal hand in it. Now of the two men, it is clear that the one who wrote the at and two was the ringleader. "'How do you get at that?' We might deduce it from the mere character of the one hand as compared with the other, but we have more assured reasons than that for supposing it. If you examine this scrap with attention, you will come to the conclusion that the man with the stronger hand wrote all his words first, leaving blanks for the other to fill up. These blanks were not always sufficient, and you can see that the second man had a squeeze to fit his quarter in between the at and the two, showing that the latter were already written. The man who wrote all his words first is undoubtedly the man who planned the affair. Excellent, cried Mr. Acton. But very superficial, said Holmes. We come now, however, to a point which is of importance. You may not be aware that the deduction of a man's age from his writing is one which has been brought to considerable accuracy by experts. In normal cases, one can place a man in his true decade with tolerable confidence— I say normal cases, because ill health and physical weakness reproduce the signs of old age, even when the invalid is a youth. In this case, looking at the bold, strong hand of the one, and the rather broken-backed appearance of the other, which still retains its legibility, although the T's have begun to lose their crossing, we can say that the one was a young man, and the other was advanced in years, without being positively decrepit. Excellent, cried Mr. Acton again. There is a further point, however, which is subtler and of greater interest. There is something in common between these hands. They belong to men who are blood relatives. It may be obvious to you in the Greek ease, but to me there are many small points which indicate the same thing. I have no doubt at all that a family mannerism can be traced in these two specimens of writing. 
I am only, of course, giving you the leading results now from my examination of the paper. There were twenty-three other deductions which would be of more interest to experts than to you. They all tended to deepen the impression upon my mind that the Cunninghams, father and son, had written this letter. Having got so far, my next step was, of course, to examine into the details of the crime, and to see how far they would help us. I went up to the house with the inspector, and saw all that was to be seen. The wound upon the dead man was, as I was able to determine with absolute confidence, fired from a revolver at the distance of something over four yards. There was no powder blackening on the clothes. Evidently, therefore, Alec Cunningham had lied when he said that the two men were struggling when the shot was fired. Again, both father and son agreed as to the place where the man escaped into the road. At that point, however, as it happens, there is a broadish ditch, moist at the bottom. As there were no indications of boot marks about this ditch, I was absolutely sure not only that the Cunninghams had again lied, but that there had never been an unknown man upon the scene at all. And now I have to consider the motive of this singular crime. To get at this, I endeavoured first of all to solve the reason of the original burglary at Mr. Acton's. I understood from something which the Colonel told us that a lawsuit had been going on between you, Mr. Acton, and the Cunninghams. Of course, it instantly occurred to me that they had broken into your library with the intention of getting at some document which might be of importance in the case. Precisely so, said Mr. Acton. There can be no possible doubt as to their intentions. I have the clearest claim upon half of their present estate, and if they could have found a single paper, which, fortunately, was in the strong box of my solicitors, they would undoubtedly have crippled our case. There you are, said Holmes, smiling. It was a dangerous, reckless attempt, in which I seemed to trace the influence of young Alec. Having found nothing, they tried to divert suspicion by making it appear to be an ordinary burglary to which end they carried off whatever they could lay their hands upon. That is all clear enough, but there was much that was still obscure. What I wanted above all was to get the missing part of that note. I was certain that Alec had torn it out of the dead man's hand, and almost certain that he must have thrust it into the pocket of his dressing gown. Where else could he have put it? The only question was whether it was still there. It was worth an effort to find out, and for that object we all went up to the house. The Cunninghams joined us, as you doubtless remember, outside the kitchen door. It was, of course, of the very first importance that they should not be reminded of the existence of this paper, otherwise they would naturally destroy it without delay. The inspector was about to tell them of the importance which we attached to it when, by the luckiest chance in the world, I tumbled down in a sort of fit, and so changed the conversation. "'Good heavens!' cried the Colonel, laughing. Do you mean to say that all our sympathy was wasted, and your fit an imposture? Speaking professionally, it was admirably done, cried I, looking in amazement at this man who was forever confounding me with some new phase of his astuteness. It is an art which is often useful, said he. When I recovered, I managed, by a device which had perhaps some little merit of ingenuity, to get old Cunningham to write the word twelve so that I might compare it with the twelve upon the paper. "'Oh, what an ass I have been!' I exclaimed. "'I could see that you were commiserating me over my weakness,' said Holmes, laughing. "'I was sorry to cause you the sympathetic pain which I know that you felt. We then went upstairs together, and having entered the room and seeing the dressing-gown hanging beside the door, I contrived, by upsetting a table, to engage their attentions for the moment, and slipped back to examine the pockets.' I had hardly got the paper, however, which was, as I had expected, in one of them, when the two Cunninghams were on me, and would, I verily believe, have murdered me then and there but for your prompt and friendly aid. As it is, I feel that young man's grip on my throat now, and the father had twisted my wrist round in an effort to get the paper out of my hand. They saw that I must know all about it, you see, and the sudden change from absolute security to complete despair made them perfectly desperate. I had a little talk with old Cunningham afterwards as to the motive of the crime. He was tractable enough, though his son was a perfect demon, ready to blow out his own or anybody else's brains, if he could have gone to his revolver. When Cunningham saw that the case against him was so strong, he lost all heart and made a clean breast of everything. 
It seems that William had secretly followed his two masters on the night they had made their raid upon Mr. Acton's, and having thus got them into his power, proceeded under threats of exposure to levy blackmail upon them. Mr. Alec, however, was a dangerous man to play games of that sort with. It was a stroke of positive genius on his part to see in the burglary scare which was convulsing the county side an opportunity of plausibly getting rid of the man whom he feared. William was decoyed up and shot, and had they only got the whole of the note and paid a little more attention to detail in the accessories, it is very possible that suspicion might never have been aroused. And the note? I asked. Sherlock Holmes placed a subjoined papers before us. If you will only come round at quarter to twelve, to the east gate, you will learn what will very much surprise you, and maybe be of the greatest service to you, and also to Annie Morrison. But say nothing to anyone upon the matter. It is very much the sort of thing that I expected, said he. Of course, we do not yet know what the relations may have been between Alec Cunningham, William Kerwin, and Annie Morrison. The results show that the trap was skilfully baited. I am sure that you cannot fail to be delighted with the traces of heredity shown in the P's and in the tails of the G's. The absence of the I dots in the old man's writing is also most characteristic. Watson, I think our quiet rest in the country has been a distinct success, and I shall certainly return much invigorated to Baker Street tomorrow. All right, thank you guys so much for listening. I, I just, it just warms my heart to know that people are are enjoying the podcast and listening. And yeah, there's nothing better in the in the world than being able to put something out into the world and have people appreciate it and enjoy it. And if you are, I want to hear from you. And if you uh, let me know while I'm recording this audiobook that you like the podcast, or you know, I guess you can leave any kind of rating you want on the podcast. But uh, hopefully, it's a good one. Um, but if you do right now, you're going to get answered for that chance to win uh, four free audiobooks so definitely check that out people another world audiobooks.wordpress.com all the instructions are right there or you can just click on the show notes and get them there thanks so much for listening today guys and remember to share the podcast with someone that you know who might enjoy a free audiobook when I was in school, I absolutely hated writing. It wasn't until I was a bit older that I came to understand the power of words. If you're a business owner, you understand that power too. A business blog, when done right, can drive sales, increase revenue, and get you more customers. But as a business owner, you probably don't have the time to do all that writing. Plus, if you're not a copywriter by trade, you might feel like you're just kind of throwing words out there and they're not actually accomplishing anything. The good news is, there's a simple solution. Check it out. I call it the ultimate blog post checklist for businesses with online stores. This checklist will allow you to write better, more effective articles that convert readers into buyers. It's full of easy to follow examples to get your creativity flowing based on experience of nearly a million words written. And best of all, it's effective on any type of article in any industry or niche. I've successfully used this exact checklist on topics from pool table reviews to investment advice. Tired of spending tons of time writing stuff that doesn't convert? This checklist will change that by giving you highly effective blog posts and articles that transform readers into paying customers. Go to invicta.enterprises slash free checklist and start saving time and transforming your writing now. That's invicta.enterprises slash free checklist.